Good afternoon. How's everybody? Uh, important thing, if you're uh, interested in UDL Amped, there are these little uh, QR code slips hanging around um, for after this session. So feel free to QR them. Um, my name is Skip Stahl. I'm a senior policy analyst at CAST. And I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves. Good afternoon. My name is Tracy Hall, and I am also from CAST. I'm a senior research scientist and instructional designer. And I'm Jamie Basham, uh, the University of Kansas and the IRN. Great. We're going to do a video. And we're going to start off with a video. So that video sets a context for what we're going to talk about over the next hour. We're going to talk to you about personalized learning. Um, we're going to, uh, I'm j I just noticed the bullet points just turned out as peas. <laughs> <laughs> personalization. <laughs> so uh, we're going to talk about personalized learning. And uh, we, we've been lucky enough to work for the last five years together uh, in a federally funded research center that has been looking at specifically online learning for students with disabilities. But we had the foresight in doing that research to say, let's look at really all kids. Let's look at the environments that all kids are engaging in within these modern learning environments. And, and our team, three of us and a few others, really kind of focused on the notion of what is personalized learning? What's going on in these environments? And what does it actually mean? Um, and so the, the video that we just showed, we're going to give you a little bit more context in a few minutes. But we want to talk to you about some of the terminology that you're going to run across in this conversation. The first one is blended learning. People have heard about blended learning, right? It's the idea wherein uh, you're going to have some sort of technology in, in the physical face-to-face -face environment where the students are using the technology. And again, bl one blended learning setting might be very different from another, another blended learning setting. Uh, within the same school, you may have blended learning going on where they look, it looks vastly different in, in different classrooms. And unfortunately, what we're seeing in many, in many different locations is that it's haphazardly implemented, uh, very similar to UDL in many in many cases. Uh, we have competency and proficiency uh, based learning and we're going to talk a lot more about that but has ever, anyone heard, you guys heard about competency? Okay, so we're going to have a little bit more detail about that in a few minutes. Uh, digital delivery systems being that we have content that is being delivered in digital forms. Oftentimes we talk about personalized learning. One of the implementations of personalized learning is, is quite literally what I would consider a warehouse. Where you, where you house a bunch of kids, hundreds and hundreds of computers, and hundreds and hundreds of kids, where they're sitting behind these computers, and the, and the computer that itself is doing the, personali the personalizing for, the, for the, the students. That's not what we did research on. Um, and in fact, what I, my own personal bias, I'm not going to speak for Tracy and Skip, would say that that is not personalized learning, because you're missing out on multiple, on various ways to basically take action and express yourself in different ways, right? So, but we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. Digital learning obviously is the investment in that, that is going on right now where we're bringing digital learning into the classrooms. And personalized learning is really where we're going to hang our hat today, right? The idea that personalized learning is, is, is learning that has been associated with each individual student, learning that is identified and designed for each individual student. In special education for years, we've talked about individualized learning. We've talked about individualized learning. Personalized learning goes beyond, in many ways, what individualized learning is. In, for instance, when we think about special education, it's often defined as something that's associated with an IEP, an individualized education program. Each student with a disability in the United States has an IEP. In many of the personalized learning settings that we're working in, each student has their own individualized learning plan. The one that we just showed and the one that we're going to spend a lot of time here talking about today, each student out of the district of 8,000 students, roughly, each student had their own individualized learning plan each student. Some students also had an IEP. Those students with disabilities also had an IEP. The individualized learning plan was vis visited each week with each student. Was visited each week with each student. We're going to talk more about that. 
And then obviously UDL, we've talked about it throughout the day. You're going to hear about the next couple days you're here, so you know what it kind of means. <coughs> sure. So uh, I want to share, <coughs> yeah. So I just want to say one thing that uh, Jamie referenced, uh, IEPs and individualized learning plans. In this particular district, urban uh, inner city district, we were in that district for a period of roughly 18 months. We were on the ground uh, every six to eight weeks for anywhere from two to four days. And <clears throat> what was striking to me was every school we visited, we never once encountered a substantially separate classroom. All the kids on IEPs were, for the most part, as far as we could tell, fully integrated into general education classrooms. So I just want to go over some uh, kind of 10 tips for personalized learning via technology to kind of set the framework here. For first is, to, and, and keep in mind, the other factor, as we worked in this district, um, we would talk about universal design for learning. They didn't use that language. They use student-centered learning. But as I go through some of these kind of factors that emerged and were kind of uh, adhered to within this district, district-wide, think about the UDL principles and the guidelines and how they begin to pop out within this language of personalization. Deliver instruction through multiple forms of media. Gather and use immediate feedback on students' understanding. Give students options. Practice independent work skills. Create a weekly must-do and may-do list. Jamie mentioned that there was a constant ongoing conferencing with teachers, in most cases on a weekly basis. And what would evolve out of that is a student might sit down with a teacher, and the teacher would say, what level are you in math? And the student would say, well, maybe 13. And what level are you in English language arts? The student might say, nine you know, you're really kind of rocketing ahead in mathematics, but you're kind of struggling with English language arts. Where do you think you should put some energy next week? Okay, pushing it back on the student, saying, what's your expectation? What seems logical here? And in most cases, the student would say, I think I ought to pay more attention to reading than to mathematics because I can float a little in math because I'm doing fine, but I have to catch up in reading. Pre-test students' knowledge before each unit. Be flexible when plans go awry. Let students drive and share the work of creating differentiated lessons. So uh, another factor that played into this, Jamie mentioned blended learning. This was a blended learning environment. Every student from five-year-olds all the way through high school had access to some sort of device. In addition to which, and we'll talk a little bit more <coughs> excuse me, about this later, um, this, the technology and the software and the personalized learning system were centralized throughout and the, all the schools that we worked in. So that came from a central distribution hub fed out to the various schools. All the schools were networked, high-speed internet. And every student could track their progress using a, a personalized student dashboard. And that became a kind of pivotal point of discussion between the teachers and the students as they moved forward. So every time a student would log on, do a series of activities, data was collected. What point did they log on? How much time did they spend? What did they do? Was there an outcome associated with that? Did they log off where they went? That sort of thing. Plus, all the students had access to that system from home. So the system was tracking on a 24-hour a day basis what was happening. So real-time data became really important. Often people will ask, is technology essential to personalized learning? Is technology essential to universal design for learning? The answer is no, but the reality is that one way, a most efficient way in many cases of collecting real-time student data is to harness the affordances of the technology to provide some of that data for you. Can you do it without the technology? Yes it's much more challenging to figure out how to collect weekly data on 25 students across multiple content areas without access to technology. So each uh, learner's performance is measured. Each learner's performance data is interpreted against some established criteria. Learning experience are personalized for each learner based on the data. And then each learner's performance is measured again. So this is an iterative process designed to address learner variability in the context of a blended learning system. 
Yes. I just want to add a little bit to what Skip said, if you want to go back one slide. Oh. I think it's really important to realize here that this data is not just data that's available for teachers. This is data that's available for the students as well. So that self-regulation that we talk about with the UDL principles, what we know in school is always a great thing for students to do. That's a huge part of what's happening here. These students see this data as well. We'll show you some more examples of that as we go along. But it's not just the teachers receiving it. Yeah, because Skip said something, and I want to reinterpret what he said just Good. a little bit. So the district didn't talk, specifically the teachers didn't talk about universal design for learning. Right. And that was true. They did not. But what was interesting is the senior architect for the entire system spoke about UDL right. continually, right? So the senior architect for this system, for designing this system across all their schools and for all their kids and thinking about how do these, how does the district operate, continually to talk, continue to talk about it, but operationalized it in such a way that they focused on, were focused on student-centered learning or personalized learning. That's what they were focused on. The amazing thing about this process was that the way that teachers picked up on that student-centered learning was was very much like when we go out and talk to teachers that have implemented UDL and they say things like I feel like I feel more like a designer than I do a teacher or I feel like it, it, my terminology is <laughs> is I feel more like a learning engineer than a teacher right these teachers would say the exact same thing and have the exact same comments and they were thinking about and as you'll see in just a few minutes they were thinking about how the students are providing and, and how multiple means is coming alive throughout all of the learning environment itself, right? So these environments were extremely, extremely active environments. Uh, extremely active environments. So, yes, please ask questions. Um, my question yes. That's a great question. So the question is, and, and we're recording, we're streaming out across the world. So the question is, and see if I can sum it up. Um, so the data that's not coming in digitally, are, this, are the teachers adding in other forms of data that's in the, like the real world setting? Is that correct? Yes, they are. And we actually uh, are going to jump, when we jump ahead, we're going to show some examples on the varying types of data that's coming into the system because these environments were data rich, right? And oftentimes what I think we do with our data in education is we have a lot of what we call dark data, right? That we have a lot of dark data. We have data that's, that's out there that exists, but it's not either being collected or utilized in any certain way. And so what this district has done in thinking about how they utilize this data is they've taken that data, and some of it is in the real world setting, and figured out ways to implement it. Yep. So we're going to get, let me see if we get to that a little bit more detail. Okay, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, competency-based education, proficiency-based education. It's also it's often associated with personalized learning, and because a lot of these factors appeared within this district on an ongoing basis, it's interesting and important just to highlight them. Um, students advance when they master the content and skills, not because they squeaked by with a C or D grade. Transparency about where students stand empowers them. So here's. Um, a factor that I want to kind of put on the table right up front because it's one that's in many ways the most controversial. In the majority of the classrooms in this particular district, every student's level, proficiency level, was available and public in the classroom to every person in that classroom. Every student knew where every other student was. Every student knew and every teacher knew where each student was and in the early grades, it was primarily ELA and math. Later, it would be ELA, mathematics, social studies, history, science, algebra, whatever. Public displays of information. So we talk about transparency. We're talking about it's open. Everybody knows. And here's the reason why. And I'll, I'll use a, a vignette. So I, I walked into a classroom that would, I think it was like 13, 14, 15-year-old kids. And there was a young girl, probably around 13, each classroom had a designated tour guide. So she would immediately come up and say, would you like me to tell you about our classroom? And I said, that would be great. She said, well, first, no one here is average. I said, well, that's a good start. And she said, 
you're either emerging below proficient, proficient, or above proficiency. And she took us over to the charts and she said, here I am, I'm doing pretty well in math. I'm at level 18, but I'm struggling in English language arts. And so we asked her, is this a problem for you that everybody knows where you are? on the you know, roughly 27 levels that students were expected to progress through during the course of a calendar year. And she said, no. And she kind of looked and she said, well, the analogy I use is, you know when a dog hears one of those funny sounds and they go like this? And kinda, that's the way she reacted to my question. You know, is this odd for you? And she kind of went, no. And I said, why is that? And she said, if I don't know where other students are, I don't know who to turn to for help. And the, the mantra in that particular classroom from the teacher was three before me. Ask three of your peers for help on this level, and you can tell which of the, your peers have already mastered this content by looking at the chart on the wall. So what was happening in addition to the transparency and the availability of actual real-time data that students were filling in those charts was it was fostering a spirit of collaboration and not competition in that environment. The expectation was that every student would help every other student at any given time. And if you had achieved mastery at a particular level, then you became someone who could teach the next person who needed it. So I know that when I, when I talk about transparency in this environment, people will go, oh no, that's terrible, kids shouldn't know where their kids are because there's a negative, uh, could be negative consequences associated with it. We didn't see any of that across an 18 month period. All we saw was students using that information to kind of collaborate, conference with their teachers and collaborate and conference with one another. I think, I think, it's, import I think it's important to note that I think one of the primary reasons, although we don't have you know, a causal understanding, but one of the primary reasons that I believe this exists was because it was accepted that there's variability in all learners. Exactly. That it was completely accepted. And you'd walk into any classroom and they would talk about there's no one average in this classroom. That we all, we all are different. Um, and in fact, you heard the students say it in that video, right? Like we all, we're all different. We all learn different ways. We all, and that was completely accepted across the learning environment. And it wasn't negative by any means. It wasn't negative at all. And in fact, in the other thing in part that's important in that process is that all students were able to show growth on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So it's not that students weren't able to show because it was personalized. I mean, it's critically critical to understand we talk about competency is that some people are going to grow faster than others in certain areas and some people are going to grow slower in certain areas, et cetera. And that was just accepted, but everyone could show growth. Everyone could show growth. Great. Is that a question? Question? Yes. What steps were taken to build those mindsets? Yes. First of all, it was building the mindset with the instructional staff and the administration. Um, so the senior administration had a vision. They would do a series of training weeks to really spend time with the instructional staff of how to then explain this process to the students. Um, in fact, in the first year we were there, we went into the high school principal's office and on the wall was a chart of all the teachers. And next to the chart, a legend on the left-hand side was emerging below proficient <laughs> or above. So what was happening was the administration said, we have an instructional process we follow here. There are certain things that need to be apparent and evident in every classroom. There are certain practices we expect you to embrace. And it's not gonna be easy to start because it means changing your mindset as an educator. And so the same proficiency system was applied to the instructional staff in those early stages and then Essentially, they were holding workshops and focus groups with students, and when new students came in, they would spend time explaining the system to them as they went forward. And often in that process, they would use other students in that explanation, because the kids, particularly in the secondary level, would listen to their peers more readily and quickly than they'd listen to the teachers. Um, Assessment, a continual part of the learning cycle, so uh, formative assessment and progress monitoring was built in. They were charting student progress on a weekly basis in most of the cases. 
Educators offer timely support, often daily, on any part of the required material. And here's another important piece. Students were asked to demonstrate competency in more than one way. In this particular environment, most of the classrooms, if a student said they had mastered something, they were asked to demonstrate that mastery in three different ways. That could be a multiple choice test. It could be an essay, it could be a movie, it could be a diorama, it could be a joint presentation with other students, it could be a song, it could be a dance. However they chose to do it, they could do it independently or collaboratively with other students who had also mastered that content. Three different ways were required for demonstration. And the purpose of that was to reinforce the notion of transference. Did you know it just in this circumstance or did you know it so it was generalizable across any environment where you might in encounter this? You want to start with some research? We've done, we've done presentations like this a number of times together, so it's like, oh, who wants to take it this time? <laughs> this is actually, the, the, the image is actually not too unrepresentative of some of the schools that, how they looked before the team went in. Uh, we were working in an urban reform district. The, the district was identified by the state to need, uh, to be uh, revitalized, redesigned, if you will, and they went into these schools and actually took them over. But many of the schools and hallways look very similar to this. In fact, one of the schools in particular uh, indicated they, ha they hauled out over 20 tons of trash out of the school as the school as they went in and to do, to do their overhaul. So there was for administrators in the room, and I know we have a few. I mean, it was it was some of it was physical plant overhaul. Others of it was obviously curricular by nature and instructional by nature. Uh, this is obviously very similar to uh, the types of uh, f types of buildings that were throughout. Uh, a, a, a large majority of the homes in the areas that we were working in look simi similar to this, and as, actually this is one of the better looking of, of the homes. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, it was, it was, what was interesting about this area in particular was this is an industrial hub throughout the U.S. This was an industrial hub just 10 to 15, 20 years ago. So this was an up and coming city about 20 years ago and uh, it's been decimated because changes in manufacturing, et cetera, um, where we don't need as many people anymore. We have robots that do a lot of our work. Um, and so we had a lot of uh, this sort of thing going on and then the schools themselves were in varying forms and shape. And so again, we had a lot of physical plant as well as curricular overhaul, et cetera. Uh, key reform. Uh, key, key features that we saw, it, they, there were turnaround schools, they, they were competency-based, we've kind of talked about that a little bit. They had extended learning time, not only multiple hours throughout the day, but then they, were, they extended throughout the summer as well. And so uh, students were in seat longer than in, in most districts, and they really weren't in seat, but in school is, I guess, a better way to say it. They used a, kind of a next generation staffing model where um, students were assigned to classrooms, but there was multiple support personnel throughout. Multiple support personnel throughout. And not only the, the, were there multiple support personnel th for students, but there were multiple support personnel for, for staff as well. So we had uh, instructional coaches, et cetera. So you had multiple layers of support within the schools to support the instruction going on and how to transform your environment, as well as the types of instruction that might be needed for kids. And then it was, a, it was a blended model that used kind of the flex model. So if, you use, if you've seen Christensen's uh, models of blended learning, it's kind of a flex model. 99.8% black and uh, Hispanic students, 100% free and reduced lunch. Um, and then the idea was is that they would spend roughly about 60% of their time in, in some sort of digital learning sort of phase. Um, that was the vision. That was the vision, and, and classroom by classroom, it was followed to a certain extent. Uh, it wasn't always that students were digitally interacting 60% of the time, and then some of the digital interaction could actually be uh, spent, uh, for instance, you would see students creating like rap songs or whatever on Google Docs, and they would be working with one another. But it, it was a very collaborative sort of space. So we had classroom placement. What was interesting is what was interesting is they didn't have grade levels. They, they, they thought grade levels were artificial by nature. So they placed students by age. They placed students by age. And so they put students of the same age, or around about the same age, in, in, with one another. So it was inclusive in that, in that nature, right? So 12-year-olds were with generally 12-year-olds, et cetera. 
um, and, and so they didn't really have grade level. So uh, another uh, kind of structural element that existed here that isn't represented in any of our slides is that um, they encouraged the teaching staff to come up with new strategies, approaches, and structures within the schools after the initial year. So a group of kindergarten teachers in one of the schools we were in said, we are constantly spending time traveling between our classes because we've decided to move students among different teachers for different types of activities because certain teachers had skills in, in certain strategies in one area and others were better in another and they would just kind of move kids around and they were in a wing in four separate rooms. So they petitioned the principal and said, you know, as we're, almost all of our stuff is digital, the library is kind of not being used. So. The next year we went in, Tracy and Jamie and I were in a library with 125 kindergarten students and four teachers. Not chaotic. Different things, you remember that site? Different things were happening at different times. Some kids were working on technology, some kids were singing over in a corner, other kids were doing different activities. But the teachers could see one another all the time and so interact in a way that they couldn't do when they were in the separate classrooms. That model evolved into what was known as a hub model. It was used at the secondary level. We were in a high school setting with, there were what, 125 kids um, in a secondary setting and then in a middle school setting with 115 kids and three teachers. Um, and that was in a, in, in a series of rooms, but all these kids were fluid moving in and out of those settings. So it's a pretty neat picture that we get to, to get to draw here and I just want to talk a little bit more about the design. When we looked at the students, the students were as, as we kind of mentioned grouped by their readiness around their age level and their progress not by exactly what their age was. All kids that are 5.2 and to you know 6.1 whatever in terms of age and months we're not always, you know, it's like really around the readiness and the general age of the students that were there. Larger classrooms when that hub situation was in the place and it was really a phenomenal thing to see how teachers could orchestrate and work with themselves and the teacher, students were completely understanding of where they needed to be and the variation of teachers and peers that they were working with. Very flexible, very uh, important for students in terms of that self-regulation and so forth. Um, the students were working on mastering, mastering very rigorous content, which was not just aligned to what the school district said that they wanted, but national, international, and state standards were definitely a component of what they needed to do as the students worked in their own pace. Certainly, there was get, they were getting encouragement, and that helped to be more self-regulated in the working that they were doing, but they're working at a pace that works well for them. It's not turning the page and going to the next lesson or the next chapter or the next unit because of a date on a calendar, but rather because of the skills that the students had mastered and worked toward. It was wonderful. Ownership of their learning, the illustrations that Skip was giving a moment ago in terms of where students were in, uh, in their awareness, but also their ownership of what it was that they had to learn, what they had in their thinking and their doing and their mastery that they'd shown and how they were progressing forward and what their next steps were going to be was very, very clear. And then obviously their students are acquiring knowledge from all sorts of resources, from the teachers certainly, from the technology that they had an advantage to take use, make use of at different times. Their peers were certainly a, a large component of their learning process as well. And we know that when teachers take that, excuse me, students take that role as teachers, that strengthens the, the person in that teacher role's knowledge as well. Be able to explain something is another good way of practicing that skill and getting good mastery of that skill. And through their own research, their own looking at reading, listening to videos, listening to, to information that they could get. Feedback, I think that we've made this point a couple of times, but can I make it again? Feedback's essential, right? Students had feedback on a real regular basis, teachers had feedback on a real regular basis, and the parents had that information as well. So knowing where students were and where they were going was a really important component to what was happening in the classrooms. UDL, anybody know these colors? <laughs> Jamie asked me if I could do this slide. <laughs> I think I can. Okay. So 
the approach really aligned directly with the principles of universal design for learning. And for those of you that have really had a lot of practice and information about UDL, you can kind of see it in how we're speaking about it. There are lots of options for choice. There are lots of options for variations in which students are not only uh, engaging in the material that they're working in, but the way in which they can express their understanding of what it is that they're learning. And to have that expression in multiple ways is really key and essential, and it does help that transfer and so forth, really helpful. Multiple means of representation, as we saw in that last slide, there are lots of ways in which the students can obtain that information and then make use of that information as they push forward. So we really see that. And the teachers learn and the students learn of themselves what is engaging for that person and what is going to help them to get into that content and get into that knowledge and understand it to push forward and, and do well. So those three principles are really underlying feature that happens a lot. As was said earlier, it wasn't a major function of the training that the teachers received. This is what you're doing in UDL, that's what you're doing in UDL, but overarching the structure, it's definitely a component that's going on. Student engagement, the student-centered learning is really key to what's going on, and all of these principles apply to that well. I think this is you. Sure. Um, so just a couple of um, asides. We spent a lot of time interviewing staff and students, both formally, as we'll talk about in a minute, and informally. Um, I remember a conversation in the early days when we were there with uh, the principal who had the teacher chart on the wall for proficiency. And we had asked her how things were going, and she said, well, I have a problem at the moment. And we said, what is that? And she said, my best ELA teacher believes and this was a high school, um, and the classes she was talking about were freshman, sophomore. My ELA teacher believes that the best way, and in some cases the only way, for students to exhibit mastery of English language arts is through writing. And she said, this is a problem because we want, our conception or our perception of literacy is much broader than that. Literacy in the digital age includes also being able to put together some multimedia presentations and use PowerPoint effectively and be able to speak. Um, and so having to funnel every student in the class to be able to generate and exhibit what they know only by writing really was against the kind of mantra that existed within this system. So they were working with that teacher but they were also aware that they had to respect that teacher's boundaries and her expectations and her belief structure. And they said, we will work with her for the next few months to see if we can convince her that in fact literacy is broader and, and English language arts expression is broader than simply writing. And they weren't saying, don't ask them to write. She was saying, ask them to write and give them the option of doing other things while you're doing that. Changing beliefs is incredibly difficult. And particularly if you've been a successful teacher for 15 to 18 years and you know what works from your style and your kids and you're unwilling or it's a struggle to give up some core belief that you have there. And so there were situations where teachers simply couldn't exist in that system because of the structure of the system just did not align with their beliefs. And that change was acknowledged. And in many cases there wasn't a particular value put to it. It was simply this is not going to work for us or for you. You're better off finding another place. We'll find a replacement for you and we'll move ahead. So um, I want to share with you just some um, screenshots and photographs and um, to give you a sense of the tone that existed in, in a number of these classrooms and in schools. So students have um, the question that we asked and started to ask was if students have increased real-time feedback data, Will they take greater ownership of their own learning? We thought the answer was yes. But we were unsure and we needed some data to find out. Um, there was a lot of discussion in many classrooms about character. T students were taught, explore the concept of grit, what grit meant, sticking to it, persevering. What was integrity, what was self-control, what was community, what was curiosity in this particular classroom? We saw signs like this and, and um, shared discussions and shared principles in almost every classroom. And they were not necessarily the same signs, but it, they were all kind of vectored towards creating a sense of community, collaboration, sharing, transparency. We're in this together, let's move forward, and high expectations. 
So that was the young woman who said, nobody here is average. Um, so this was one classroom said, level one was, I don't understand this yet. And level two was, I need more practice. Level three was, I understand, can do it by myself. Level four was, I not only can do this, but I can explain it to someone else. So that was the sense of putting students in a, really making mastery concrete, saying, you know this, you know how to do this, and you can teach it to someone else. This type of, of chart was always on the wall in every classroom. It looked different, the language might be a little different, but there were always four levels. Um, in one classroom, uh, the teacher who was in the video, actually the young man in the video, had discovered that he had, for whatever reason, he ended up a classroom of like, it was 70% 10-year-old boys or 11-year-old boys, and they were all into race cars. So what they did was they took the proficiency level and assigned, you know, the like was like a Kia at the bottom going up to a Ferrari at the top, you know, and they could each have little car stickers associated with the levels of the achievement that they had. Okay, so this was, um, I mentioned, and we can, this was the transparency, these are the types of transparency charts that exist. So this, I can do this this way. Right here were a series of level benchmarks leading to a competency. Here are the students. Here's where they currently are. Similarly, over here, you can't see it, but here's a level of, these are benchmarks leading to mastery. These are the students. This is the uh, achievement chart in that particular area. What do people think about this? This is a pretty um, challenging concept for many to have students' academic achievement publicly available to any student and anyone who walks into the classroom, right there, right up front. Yes? Yeah. Great. So um, in this situation, so we're talking about student data privacy. I'm trying to think how best to answer this. Uh, the key with student data privacy is what's known as personally identifiable information and actually sharing of data. Those uh, constraints don't necessarily emerge in this type of instructional environment because everybody, the teacher knows who every student is to begin with. They tend to know where they live and who their parents are and all of that. And then if you, and, and keep in mind, this is something that was dealt with um, pretty directly with the parents, that this was the model. And, and this was a kind of, um, open enrollment uh, reform district, so any student from anywhere in the city could enroll. Parents could also remove their kids if they didn't like this particular model. So there was a lot of permissioning that was already going on within that structure, so the student, uh, student data privacy issue actually didn't emerge in this circumstance. Yes? Uh-huh. Which, uh, which, yeah, I would be the first to say this is actually a very controversial practice. Um, yeah, and you can't because you the more you think about it, you go, really, do I want to do that? But we're what we're doing is actually trying just trying to share with you what our experience was and what we saw emerging from this environment and what struck us over and over and over again was the lack of competition and secrecy around achievement. And that students were talking with one another about competencies, masteries, who was working together, and it fostered a level of collaboration in what had previously been an incredibly difficult um, environment for a lot of these kids. So I think there are contradictory notions here with existing thought, that's exactly right, yes. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the, another thing that's important for you to see here is we're used to a standards based district where we, we have interpreted learning as a linear process that you do one, then you do two, then you do three. 
or then you do A, B, then C. It's you have to you have to consider that it's been personalized first of all, and it's competency based. And so what you're even seeing here is you're seeing students that have done this, but then they've done this, right? It's been personalized. It's competency based. You see students that have done this, and then they've done this, and then they've pro progressed this way. That it's not necessarily designed in a linear way. We have interpreted learning to be linear. We have interpreted learning to be linear, and not only have we interpreted it, we have created a factory-based model in education to say everyone is linear, and this is the way you're going to learn. But in reality, there's a lot of variability, right? In reality, I mean, we had a, we had a high school student tell us just a few minutes ago, not everyone learns the same way, and sometimes I have to do it this way, and sometimes I have to do it that way, right? So. While this is somewhat controversial, it allowed it did allow for it did allow for a personalized stance to come forward. It, it allowed for students to show growth and progress. We're going to show you the data in just a minute, by the way. It, um, but it allowed for it allowed for growth, and so it is controversial. In fact, we we presented this a couple years ago to folks in D.C. and uh, so we had a bunch of. Uh, project leaders and directors and, and, uh, and folks in the U.S. Department of Education. We had 100 or so, a couple hundred people watching. And, um, and I kind of brought this up, and they, they, I thought they were going to run me out with pitchfork, right? Like, they thought this was like, how could you do this to someone? And, but the thing is, is we did. We continually asked the same question of each kid that we talked to, and they were like, they kind of gave that look like, but we're all different. It's, you know, they don't think about it as competition. So it was interesting, but controversial nonetheless. There was another question. Yes. Mastery level, yeah. Question. What does it look like in terms of transcripts? I don't think we know. We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> How's that for a quick answer? Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I won't at this time because I'll just keep going. But your question was? Great. Thank you very much. Good. All right. Well, we're going to come back to this because we'll show you some more examples of things like this. But we did want to touch. Um, I'd mentioned that uh, the curriculum was centrally delivered, the digital curriculum. So this was an economical way to do it. It was a way to get all the schools wired and connected and to make sure that there was a central hub of data that was being collected that could be analyzed. So in this case, they had uh, what was known as a buzz learning platform. It was a personalization platform that provided the students with uh, their dashboard and provided teachers with, you know, kind of group or classroom or level uh, access to data. Uh, student information system was PowerSchool, assessment tools, global scholars, performance series. Um, and then um, digital content providers. Notice it's a mix of open source license and teachers, uh, teacher created content. Um, it was created according to a certain structure, so the, each, of, uh, each of the content materials could actually pass data back to the centralized system once a student logged on or a teacher logged on to do that. Um, this was a kind of 
outtake from a part of a student dashboard. And it's probably hard to see for those in the back of the room, but the first entry up here is today's accomplishments. Three activities completed today. So it would provide a student with a green light if they had actually completed a particular activity on that day. And this was also associated, these, each of these, how can I say this? This was associated with each activity associated with a level. So every time a student engaged in an activity, they'd get this summary uh, to kind of match it. Progress monitor here, if the activity was expected to go through a sequence of you know, 12 steps or something like that, that would indicate where their progress. There'd be an indicator of past due assignments. This student is a little behind. Uh, seven, uh, due soon, so they would put in what's uh, due for next week or whatever. The student have badges associated with certain levels of achievement and mastery. And my favorite part of this is right here. Um, we spent a lot of time with the developers of this system talking about how we might use this from a research perspective, because it was one way that was constantly available to the students to provide feedback about what they had just been asked to engage with. So um, the question was here, there are three levels. Um, did I understand what I was asked to do? Was this of any interest to me? And how much effort did I put in? And so those three variables are, are pretty simple to track. And the nice thing about that is, is it gives students an immediate kind of statement to be able to feedback to the system was, yeah, I understood this. Was I interested? Nah, not particularly. How much effort did I put in? Zip. How'd I do? 100%, right? So, I mean, you can, you get these different variables associated with it. So, this had, this type of student feedback mechanism built into the system only appeared in certain places. And we said, you know, anytime that there's an assessment or something that was formative as students move forward to demonstrate progress, It'd be nice to have this available because then we could correlate student achievement with indicators of effort, understanding, and interest, um, which would give us some additional and rich information. Yes, question. I'm sorry? It was called Buzz, yeah. It was built by, built by Brain Honey. Um, yes, that's correct. Um, so these are some other uh, examples. This is uh, Buzz home screen, uh, elementary level. So a student would log on and they might have a series of activities associated with that. They were just um, like pages where a student and buttons where a student could punch and say, I'm going in here. Um, this was from an anatomy and physiology class, I believe in the secondary level uh, routine. But what was nice here was um, there was this uh, learn, practice, and exhibit kind of process that students would go into. And the reinforcement that learning was iterative and continuous, not something that fixed point. That fixed point gave you a step up to the next challenge, moving through. And then this was another example of um, student level and student achievement. And what it says up here is, where am I? Um, and of course, based upon certain content areas, I believe in this again, this was middle school. Okay, so this was just a quick summary. Um, this was a first iteration of uh, secondary level kind of breakdown uh, with practice. It was a unit project, so you could see that there was learn, practice, assess, and apply. Those sequences, they would go through some changes about that sequence as we went through the study, but this generally held true. Um, all resources aligned to standards. There were links into textbooks and everything through this system. And again, it was available in school and at home. Yep. I think another thing that's important about this structure is that it, it is, as Skip was saying, online, but, there were, it's, but it's a hybrid. There are blank courses, but there are also courses that teachers could modify or make use of in the way that they were. And that open source-ness or that ability for teachers to make those modifications and stuff was really strong. The reality of that also, though, is that that's, you know, that's nice and taxing on teachers, too. So that's something to kind of keep in mind as a teacher, not to try to do this for every single class that you're doing, but, but make some variations on that and make use of it in the way that you can. Because your time is really tight um, and you can't design everything for everything, and everything for every course that you're teaching. And so that was a balance that teachers needed to learn how to develop. 
Oh, I'm, I'll say what Jamie just said. They shared courses, too. They were open to share with one another within classes in the district. So that was very, very helpful. So making modifications to something else that somebody had designed to personalize it for you in your classroom was, was easy enough for teachers to do, and that sharing was really well done. Sorry. Great. No, thank you. Okay, so this was examples of evidence. This teacher said, um, I want to give you some examples of how you can demonstrate mastery. So board game poster, foldable comic strip, globster, flashcards, crossword puzzle, uh, story or poem, chart descriptions, flip book, 3D model, 2D model, wibbly site, collage, muzzy. So, and the kids would be asked to add to this. Or various vehicles for being able to take advantage of what the resources were to demonstrate skills that they had acquired. Yes. Good question. There was an overall rubric that they would apply, um, but in some cases, we had teachers who, we knew of teachers who were working on things like PowerPoints and multimedia presentations versus just a, you know, a written document, and they had the option of doing a multiple choice test that was always available in the system. But, so in some schools, they developed their own rubrics associated with it, and in other schools, there was a general rubric that was applied to each of those uh, kind of media vehicles. Okay? Yes. Keep interrupting, Skip. <laughs> so I think that, that this is a really nice uh, example of a range, a huge range of uh, ways in which students could make selections as to how that they would demonstrate their understanding of knowledge. This is not the case always for every teacher with, every with, with all of the classes that they're teaching. There are times in which it's really appropriate to make a smaller number of options available. It doesn't mean they can't have options, but it's not such a huge range. That's going to depend on a whole lot of things. The, the students in the classroom and their ability and their knowledge of these kinds of things. What kind of teaching has happened in advance of that to prepare the students for being able to, to demonstrate their understanding with this range of things. So that probably grew. Those options can grow over the course of the school year and it might vary tremendously based on uh, the courses that are being taught as well so this is a really wonderful array of examples but don't feel as teachers that we have to provide those that array that huge number every single time we have options for students okay so I know we're getting towards the end uh, and we could tell you about all the research we did we were there for multiple years uh, we were on the ground for uh, you know two to three days each month for a couple years, and we conducted multiple research projects within that time period. We're not going to go into all of them here today. In the proceeding that we have, in the in the proceedings for the summit, you can read a little bit more about that. You can obviously approach us in the hallway, et cetera, too. Um, but what we do want to show you some of the data, right? We want to show you some of the data because we're researchers and we have to do that. It's it's written into a mandate. Um, but the percentage, we want to talk about some of the growth patterns that we saw. This is a percent of students that met at least one year's growth in a given year. Again, we're, we're looking at, uh, this is an urban reform district. Uh, folks, from, folks from outside the U.S., you may not know that, uh, that within most of the urban core of the U.S., we don't have very much growth taking place on an annual basis. It actually is a huge problem that's going on. Within this, we saw a majority of the students, both in math and English, uh, making uh, at, le at least one year's growth. Some of this is two years growth. So let's look at the two year growth, right? Here's the percent of students making two year growth. Ag again, we're not seeing grade levels here. These are age levels. These are age levels. And then the percent of growth. All right, here's another one. So if we look at students with disabilities that had IEPs and those who were just were considered quote unquote average students, right? which I'm kind of, that was a little joke. Um, <laughs> uh, students with IEPs uh, and students without IEPs. We have students with IEPs in blue, students without IEPs in red. However, every single student had their own individualized learning plan. Every student, right? And, and by the way, what we're seeing there is at least one year growth in mathematics. We're looking at another year's data. This is a, uh, the second year we were there. And what we're looking at across here is across schools. Again, what we have broken it down to are uh, students with uh, disabilities in red and students without designated disabilities in green. And we're looking at uh, one plus years growth in mathematics. One plus years growth in mathematics. You see anything interesting there? Yeah. We have a lot of students making more than one year's growth, right? Or at least one year's growth. And we have, at times, we have students identified with disabilities making uh, more growth than others. 
Here's what we look at like an ELA, same breakdown, red and green, right? I'm trying to move fairly quickly so we can get to some more questions and conversation. So critical to this, critical to this, uh, the district's design was the notion of self-regulation. Critical to the district's design was the notion of self-regulation. Part of that understanding is is the idea that students took ownership in their own learning. Students took ownership in their own learning. In fact, we, I remember it was a cold day in February, I think the first year we were there, uh, I think Skip and I and one of our colleagues were in a room at a middle school. I don't know if Tracy was there on this trip. But uh, we were talking to a young man and interviewing him, and we said, you know, what do you think of this school? He goes, when I first got here, I hated this school. I absolutely hated this school. And he, he goes on to say that, you know, his parents made him come to this school. But the reason he hated this school was because this school thought that he was in charge of his own learning. And he knew that was completely wrong, right? It's now February, so he's been in the school for a while. And he says, and you know what? I still hate this school. But I hate this school now because I have to go home at 4.30 every day. And I have a lot of catching up to do. Right, and so it's just a, it took on a different attitude. I don't know if we want to talk any more about this slide. I want to try and get to questions. I'm looking at the time. Yeah, I just want to say a couple of things quickly. Um, go back to that next one. Um, the, uh, no, next. Uh, no, back. Oh, sorry, forward. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> hey, not good at giving directions, apparently. Um, so, uh, just a couple of things. We had a very uh, kind of unique opportunity here. We had, uh, because we were doing research with the district, they provided us with a lot of information. We were able to identify which students were IEP students, which students were not IEP students. So the personally identifiable information, it's uh, permissible to give if the district is uh, guiding the research. We have also access to reams and reams of performance series data uh, for um, assessment in ELA and mathematics. And we did a series of self-regulation grit surveys that were distributed roughly, we, I, uh, the return, we distributed 5,000 students and we got roughly 3,500 returns. We could break those down by age, grade level, and then cross-reference that with achievement and demographics. So big, large data analysis. Um, We've, I just wanted to share one thing that was kind of interesting was what we found through all, all the data that if you were on IEP that was correlated with negative academic performance uh, across uh, all age levels and uh, across all, uh, all genders. However, if you had a strong grit score and or a strong uh, self-regulation score, it actually mitigated totally the effect of the, the negative effect of the IEP. So those kids who exhibited strong self-regulation and strong grit skills were indistinguishable from their non I, from their non IEP age mates. That was a significant finding. I mean that because the distinction was quite um, well quite large. Anyway, we should um, stop here and yeah, ask for questions. Yeah, so uh, we want to open it up. I mean, we've kind of been taking questions throughout, and we're getting on our time. So questions? Uh, yep. here. So I'm wondering, for the students who, for example, are, are older, but they're, but they're moving slower, um, and so they end up being grouped together with much younger students, does that create a sort of stigma? Again, most the students were grouped by age, right? right? They so they weren't with younger students. They are grouped by age. So you had 12-year-olds that, what was interesting in, in one particular case, you'd, we walked into a science classroom, and I remember, I, we walked into a science classroom and one that does some work in STEM. I would see kids that were doing pretty advanced sort of work, but then I would see what I would consider like third, fourth grade uh, sort of books as well. And, but the kids were working with one another as a middle, what I would consider a middle school cl classroom. So we, we would see kids doing pretty advanced work and then kids were doing younger work, and then they would be working with one another. So, but it was by age. They're physically in the same classroom or the same environment. Yeah. 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 So that's a good question. Uh, let's go here and then I'll come back to this side. So I'm going to be a little controversial. Please. As a special educator, I have to ask. So we're putting students in these classrooms to earn mastery on content, and I'm all about that. Super, let's do that. 
and we're grouping based off of age, but working towards that. So the students who have, I mean, significant cognitive impairments, if we're moving them with age, but hopefully with mastery and they can work with each other and we're all about full inclusion, where does that balance come in and how do we get those students to access the same? Do you see what I'm trying to ask? So about students with significant disabilities, do you guys want to take it? <laughs> we, we actually did not, we did not see a whole bunch of students with significant cognitive disabilities in this environment. Um, and I don't know whether it was an artifact of where those students may have been placed or choice or parent choice. Okay, so that was the other, that's the other variable. Um, but, so we, I, we don't have a quick answer. We're going to fight over the microphone. But I do want to say that for many students, I don't know how significant those cognitive disabilities might be, but there were uh, paraprofessionals that were working, teaming with the teachers to work with the students and provide supports as they needed it and support as they worked with teams of other children. So, and here's the, here's the other thing, and then I know Howard's got a question, I'll go over that. So here's the other thing that's interesting. We'd go into classrooms and we'd say, okay, which students have a disability? Because that's our primary focus. And oftentimes the teachers didn't know right like like they would actually say hmm I know I have students with disabilities right and they'd have to go look even the special education teachers would hmm because they were just working with everyone so that was also an issue too so we so I do know like in the data set we had students with more severe significant disabilities but we just I mean didn't so I think that's I think that's a whole another area that we can get into so I'm gonna I, no, but it's a great question, it's a great question. When you look from building to building, what uh, factors did you see uh, as far as variance in their success? So this is a great question. Actually, this is the first year's question that we were challenged with. The, the district said to us, we'd love to do, have you guys come do research, but you need to figure out what's working and then what's not and grow what's working and diminish what's not. Uh, and I, there's a number of things. Obviously, a teacher's commitment to the principles that were aspired to here. In fact, there were, the earlier question, there were five areas that each teachers were, all the teachers were working on. Uh, one was the mindset. One was, I'm sorry, uh, database decision making. Dis, uh, inv uh, learning environment design. Uh, uh, assessment in, 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 a, in a modern learning environment. And then reflective practice, yeah. reflective practice, and <laughs> yeah. Um, so those were the areas. And when we did alignment to those, it was obviously uh, teachers buy into those things and ability to implement those things. But then the other thing is, and Skip kind of brought this up, was the grit and self-regulation of the students and some of that data. The direction, support, and guidance of the principal in adhering to the structure of the district. We uh, actually, we had met with the senior administration and the chancellor of the department came in. Do you remember that day? And he, it was in February, I think. And he said, oh, I was just rough to add a fire principal. And Jamie and I kind of looked and we both said, and he looked at it and he said, I know, I know. February seems like a stupid time to fire a principal. We could have waited till June, but you know what? I couldn't expose the kids and the teachers to that incompetence any longer. It had to go, new principal in place, things are going to get better. So there was a rapid kind of, you know, here's what we're doing. Well, what was important, and that was all across the entire district, right? They had various gates in process, so they had multiple. So every principal had a, had a learning coach of their own that was assigned to them. But after you surpass a certain level, they're like, you're too incompetent, you're gone. And it was just like, boom. And they did nationwide searches for both teachers and principals, by the way. And this, I, there's, uh, you're, okay, you sure? <laughs> I was just curious if your research picked up on any of the discipline practices or policies that went along with this implementation of this type of personalized learning and whether or not they encountered situations where they did have to exclude students from the learning environments. Uh, uh, yeah, or it doesn't really matter. I mean, they right. limited discipline. Right, so, well, but there were distinctions between the schools. One of the middle school, one of the schools we worked with, which was a K-8 school, had been the most violent school in the city the year before. There were like uh, something like 116 incidents where police were called because of gang fights and everything else. That school had uniforms. And in that school, kids transitioning for classes transitioned along a line. 
and that school had a very structured lunch, cafeteria, and playground oversight because they really wanted to tighten up very clearly, make sure it was a safe environment for those kids. And then as we worked in that school, we saw it begin to loosen up. Another school never did that. You know, kids were willy-nilly in the hallways and there was no sense of threat or anything else and parents were in and out. So it really depend it often changed neighborhood to neighborhood depending upon what the needs were. All right. Um, if this was um, folks uh, at home trying to get online, uh, were there any issues with people having internet in this community? And then, uh, or what was the situation for the community? And then the other question is about. Oh, um, I know you said this is extended. Would you consider like the summer and the after school formal or informal? Like, were they extended completely formally? Or so, uh, as far as first question, uh, was there? Uh, 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 a lack of uh, ability to get online, et cetera. There was some of that, on, and we didn't quite study that. We've studied that in other districts, but we didn't study that, and most recently, in fact. We didn't study it uh, specifically in this district, although some of the schools opened up. Like one of the schools in particular in one of the poorest areas of the town was uh, uh, known as a community hub, and so people would be able to go to that area in particular. As far as your second question, uh, the extended school year. This was something that was challenging to the district. Were they, was it formal or informal? And it was really by design of the individual school. Like one of the schools in particular, uh, one of the high schools was looking at developing more of an internship sort of program during the extended period in order to capture more students to come in and say, hey, this is meaningful because I'm actually doing more authentic work. But I, I wouldn't say that's consistent across. You guys have anything else? Okay. I am looking at the time, and we are completely out of time. I know my team's going to be yelling at me because we don't let people out. So um, uh, please catch us in the hallway if you have other questions. We'd be happy to talk to you. And our proceedings are online, and, and the PowerPoint is, is going to be updated on the SCED, and you'll be able to get that. Okay?